Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today discussing the FCC's new rule on small cell wireless deployment. A few housekeeping items to get us started. All of your telephone lines are muted. Any questions you have during this webinar must be submitted using the Q&A button on the top right-hand portion of your screen. Jason and Claire will do their best to answer all questions during or at the conclusion of the webinar. If your question isn't answered, we will follow up with you after via email. We are offering CLE credits for this webinar. Certificates and a copy of the PowerPoint slide deck will be emailed to all attendees next week. And now for our webinar. The next generation of wireless services, known as 5G, present completely different local regulatory issues than networks of the past. The new 5G networks require telecommunications companies to build thousands of small cells at a faster pace with a far greater density of deployment. The FCC recently adopted a new ruling that is designed to interpret what kind of local regulations would be preempted under federal law because they are considered to effectively prohibit the deployment of small cell wireless infrastructure in local communities. Today, Jason and Claire will explain the ruling and its potential impact on California municipalities, including considerations in enacting fees and charges, imposing non-fee requirements, complying with shock talks, and grandfathering. Their webinar will help municipalities navigate the FCC's renewed focus on local regulatory environments. And now to introduce our speakers. Jason Rosenberg has more than 10 years of experience assisting all sizes of municipalities in a wide range of special districts. He currently serves as city attorney for the city of South San Francisco and general counsel for the Grattan Community Services District and special counsel to other public agencies. Jason advises on matters relating to public contracting, constitutional law, land use, telecommunications, code enforcement, government ethics, Public Records, and the Brown Act. Claire Lai leverages her prior in-house experience as Deputy County Counsel and Interim Deputy City Attorney to advise clients on a comprehensive range of municipal law issues, including housing development, conflicts of interest, telecommunications, and leases and license agreements negotiations. Claire currently serves as Assistant City Attorney to the cities of South San Francisco and Walnut Creek and the town of Los Altos Hills. Jason and Claire, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. And Claire and I are going to go over this new ruling and how it impacts uh, the public entities. To start, I thought it'd be helpful to give a little bit of background on why, how we got to the FCC order. And part of that is the Telecommunications Act of 1996. This act was the first major overhaul of the Telecommunications Act of 1934, and it addressed a number of issues um, with the new technologies that were expanding around that time. It was really the first time that the internet was addressed by um, less federal legislation, and it really, in many ways, dealt with deregulation and opening up markets to competition important to our issues here with wireless uh, deployment in local entities is Section 253 and a few others, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, 253 is also the section that allows the FCC to preempt if local uh, regulations uh, conflict. Um, and 253A, which is on your slide right now, is uh, a state or local regulation cannot prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting an entity to provide any interstate or interstate telecommunication service. And that is really at the core of this kind of goal to deregulate and open up markets to competition with this with the Act of 1996. But in this new... Uh, statutory framework adopted by the federal government, um, they still gave local governments some authority to manage the right-of-way and also um, require fair and reasonable compensation from telecom providers for the use of that right-of-way. However, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 
requires that it has to be non-discriminatory and a neutral basis and publicly disclosed. So for California entities, Public Utilities Code Section 7901 and 7901.1 is consistent with that ability to manage the right-of-way and be in control of our right-of-way, which is normally something reserved to localities. Section 332 also is relevant to the FCC order, um, and that is that local government regulation of the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless cannot unreasonably discriminate against other providers and have and prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services. And we're going to go into that in more detail fully. This is also where the shot clock came from, um, which we will talk about later, but the order has a number of kind of facets and shot clock is one of them, so I thought it would just be helpful to, to, to lay that out. Um, the section does give state and local governments the authority over decisions regarding placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities, albeit there are some now restrictions with that, but we still do re retain some authority to, to manage. It's not a whole wholesale abrogation of those uh, local regulation uh, authorities. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Claire to talk about the FCC rulemaking process and how we are at this, this new order that is kind of at the forefront of our uh, minds now. Thanks, Jason. Um, so just to give a little background of how we really got to this ruling in September, the FCC has rulemaking authority that's given by Congress under federal statutes, and in, as relevant to our case here, the FCC makes a rule in the realm of telecommunications law if there's a new statute or if there was a petition that was filed for rulemaking to suggest new rules or amendments to existing rules. And upon those things happening, the FCC will issue a notice, propose rulemaking, um, and they will sort of invite public comment um, and receive submissions or evidence that would be helpful for their determination. And that determination comes in the form of a report and order, which is what we have here before us today, um, that may adopt new rules, change existing rules, or say that there would be no rule changes necessary. And after that ruling is issued, there is a period for interested parties to file a petition for reconsideration. That period is 30 days from the date that the ruling is is published in the Federal Register, and you have to either complete this process or wait until the 30-day period is over before you can actually file a lawsuit in court to challenge whatever ruling that they have issued. And so before us, this ruling that was issued in September 2018, it comprises of two parts. The first part is a declaratory ruling. Uh, that's the interpretations of the provisions of the Telecommunications Act that Jason just went over. And the other part is the report and order, which establishes the shot clocks that are the time period for which government entities must act on applications to um, site wireless facilities. So this is where Jason covered previously that the shot clock comes from Section 332 C7 of the Telecommunications Act, and local governments must act on requests for uh, authorization to place, construct, or modify personal wireless service facilities within a reasonable period of time. And first, back in 2009, the FCC has adopted two time periods where they determined that this was the definition of a reasonable period of time as provided by statute, and that is 90 days for processing collocation applications and 150 days for processing new applications. And in the traditional wireless facility setting, this essentially means existing facilities versus a new base, base station, a tower, or a pole. In addition to that timeline, there is also a statutory shot clock that's codified in Section 6409 of the Spectrum Act, which is also a part of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Jobs Act. You may hear that 
um, more often. And this is a time period for approving certain eligible requests to modify an existing tower or base station. This applies to specific types of requests only, which are collocation, removal, or replacement of transmission equipment. And if you have such an eligible request and that does not substantially change the physical dimensions of your existing tower or base station, the local government is required to approve that request. And so you may note that this is a little bit different from the FCC shot clock in that the FCC timelines only require the local government to act on the application or the authorization request. And the local government may deny or approve the request, whereas the Section 6409 mandates them to approve an eligible request uh, for, to modify the existing tower base station. Um, it is important to note that the FCC 2009 timelines have been codified in California under Government Code 6564.1, and they come with a deemed approved remedy, which means that if your city or county fails to act on the application within the 90 or 150-day timeline, you, uh, the application before you will be deemed granted. And also, these timelines are still in effect. They're not overruled or changed by the by the September 2018 ruling, and they'll continue to be in effect um, for the time to come. So we're going to go into the 2018 September ruling. Uh, this ruling became effective on January 14, 2019, uh, with the exception of the portion of the order that relates to aesthetic standards, uh, which Jason will talk about later, those do not go into effect until April 15 of this year. And we first want to note that this ruling is now being challenged on appeal, and there were six petitions that were filed in the 1st, 2nd, 9th, and 10th circuits, and they are all now being consolidated and transferred to the 9th circuit. Um, it was initially consolidated in the 10th circuit because of a judicial lottery lottery process to determine which venue will hear the case. But now um, they've all going to be transferred to the Ninth Circuit. And it's interesting the reason behind the transfer is granted because it implicates another FCC order that was issued back in August of 2018. That August order says that moratorium, the local moratorium on telecommunication equipment violates Telecommunications Act as an effective prohibition. And so the city of Portland challenged that August order in the Ninth Circuit about two and a half weeks after it went into effect. And because of the timing of that challenge, the FCC was required to respond to it in the Ninth Circuit. And now the um, petitioners in challenging the September ruling says that these two rulings are essentially the same case, and therefore they should all be heard the Ninth Circuit and the Tenth Circuit agreed. So now they will be transferred to the Ninth Circuit and also the moratorium order and the small cell order will be reviewed together by the same court. And there is also a request uh, for stay that was denied by the Tenth Circuit. Um, they may be another one in the Ninth Circuit now that we were obviously we don't know that for sure. Um, the Tenth Circuit denied a stay not because they found there was not a likelihood of uh, success on the merits, but they determined there was no irreparable harm uh, for the cities if the order continues to go into effect while the appeal is pending. So the takeaway from this issue right now is that the order is being challenged. That is, is essentially unknown. It may be overturned. It may be overturned in part. It may be upheld or vacated, we just don't have further guidance on how it, things will proceed and whether or not the FCC's exercise of the authority is lawful or not. And so we wanted to explain to you really the contents of the orders so that either you would want to incorporate them into your local regulations um, and determine whether or not you want to be bound by the certain, these certain requirements even if the FCC order is vacated or overruled. Um, also, you would be prepared when carriers raise the grounds that are cited in this order to, neg 
negotiate with your more favorable term in agreement or for less stringent requirements in your local ordinances or regulations. The first thing that the order does is to codify in this Code of Federal Regulations the definition of small cells. And this is essentially a checklist where the facility has to meet each of these requirements in order to constitute a small cell and be covered within the scope of this order. And the prominent features of this list is the maximum size, the mounting height on structures, and some miscellaneous federal requirements. Uh, the maximum size of the equipment is uh, at most 28 cubic feet, and the antenna is at most 3 cubic feet. Um, that would be the first step to qualify as a small cell. Um, also, if this facility is mounted on a structure that's 50, at most 50 feet high, or at most 10% taller than the adjacent structures, or does not increase the, the mounting structure by over 50% or over 10% of adjacent heights, then it's likely to qualify as a small cell. And also, um, there's some subtle requirements about the structure not being on tribal land or it does not qualify for federal antenna registration and it complies with federal radio frequency standards. And so you'll find that this list will pretty much cover the facilities that are, are being proposed by providers and that are coming to locate on the poles and structures in your jurisdiction in, in the right of ways. And the order next talks about what constitutes an effective prohibition. So as Jason had previously covered, this comes from the, um, the Telecommunications Act uh, preventing local jurisdiction from prohibiting provision of telecommunication services. The difference here, the FCC goes away really from a gap in coverage standard and goes to a material limitation standard. So in California, and especially in California, I think that cities have been relying on the gap in coverage standard that was adopted by the Ninth Circuit, which states that if a carrier wants to, wants to show that a local regulation is an effective prohibition of telecommunication services, they have to show that it prevents them from closing a significant gap in their own service coverage. And this is a fact-specific determination. So it's not really an easy standard to overcome. Imagine if Verizon wants to locate in your residential neighborhood, which prevents um, them from erecting a, a, a tower base station. Then they have to show that it prevents them from closing a gap in their own service coverage in that area. So it's not something that's easy to overcome. But now this ruling states instead that it will adopt the material limitation standard, which is used by the first, second, and tenth circuits. And this is a broader standard which says it, a state or local government requirement is an effective prohibition and violates the Telecommunications Act if it materially limits or inhibits the ability of anybody compete in a fair and balanced legal and regulatory environment. So what does that look like? Um, carriers are unable to provide additional services. Um, they are not able to bring new services to an area. The, the local government rules give the advantage to one service but not others. Um, so the new sort of regulatory scheme really can allow carriers to argue that there is effective prohibition on the part of the local government, even if there's no total governmental ban on the provision of services. And also significant in the ruling is that the FCC intends to cover all governmental terms for small cells to access the right-of-way and locate on public property. And as you may be aware, there's a common argument that cities and counties rely now that to say that they are acting in a proprietary capacity rather than in a regulatory capacity when it comes to government properties in the right of way. And the ruling interpretation of the Telecommunications Act is that there is no such thing as the local government acting in a proprietary capacity because they're in charge of operating the right of way on in trust of the public. And so therefore, when it comes to government properties in the right of way, they're all subject 
to the terms of this ruling and they're subject to the Telecommunications Act and include, including any government-owned utility poles. So you may see that carriers push back on, on a common argument that the city is acting in a regulatory, I'm sorry, acting in a proprietary capacity instead of acting in a regulatory capacity and therefore there's more freedom or flexibility to negotiate the terms. And this, this is common in lease agreements for antennas, traditional wireless services facilities, and now it is more likely to be utilized in negotiations for small cell facility installations. However, um, I would note that the FCC declined to address how this will affect public property outside the right of way. So we don't have much guidance on, on those respects. And you're most likely to see the greatest pushbacks from carriers um, on your agreements and regulations about local fees that are uh, described in the ruling. Um, the FCC says that local fees must be objective, reasonable, and equally applied. And although they do agree that local governments can require fair and reasonable compensation as stated under federal law, they interpret that term to mean only the reasonable approximation of actual and direct costs incurred by the government. So this is cost specific to deployment, which is like processing applications, maintaining the right-of-way, and maintaining the right-of-way structures. And it's not, uh, for example, consultant fees or fees beyond the cost of discovery or cost of recovery um, or unreasonable costs if you can't justify it. And so what local fees does the commission intend to cover? Um, Right-of-way access fees, if they're applicable in the jurisdiction, um, as Jason notes, Public Utilities Code Section 7901 allows telecommunication carriers to be in the right-of-way, so that's not really applicable in California. Um, however, there's fees for using public property in the right-of-way. Um, essentially, jurisdictions have whole attachment fees, um, Know, conduit attachment fees, um, application fees, review fees, staff time, charges that are imposed in contracts or other arrangements, and these may mean uh, license agreements or master contracts that you have with a carrier that impose a call attachment fee and administrative staff due time. And so what does reasonable local fees mean under the ruling? Um, in the FCC's view, everything is a violation of the Act unless they are a reasonable approximation of the cost that's specifically related and caused by the deployment. They're objectively reasonable, and they're not higher than fees charged to similarly situated competitors. And they listed a number of items that include processing fees, maintaining the right of way as we covered, um, Anything that's sort of unreasonable and justifiable um, in the FCC's view would not qualify as reasonable local fees. And the commission does give some examples of reasonable fees. Um, for non-recurring fees, $500 for one to five facilities and an additional $100 for each facility beyond that number. Um, and for recurring fees, it's $270 per facility per year. So think if you have a master license agreement that gives you the right, gets, gives carriers the right to go onto your polls, then each facility every year pays a certain poll tax and fee. That's an example of a recurring fee. Uh, so you would likely see the carrier side to this, these examples as the amounts of fees that local governments are authorized to charge. Um, but we would know that these are examples or safe harbors that are established by the FCC. They're not necessarily um, the defined amount of reasonable fees. Um, but we don't have much guidance beyond how that amount should be decided. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jason on Estega's requirements. Uh, but before I do that, There's, are there any questions? There was a question about um, the government code that codifies the shot clock. Um, can you say that again, Claire, for the audience? 
Yeah, it's Government Code Section 65964.1. Great. Thanks, Claire. So um, I'm going to jump into some of the aesthetics and non-fee requirements as they pertain to localities from the FCC order. And um, if you do have questions, send them through the, 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 the question and answer chat box. We will try to get to them if we can. If not, we'll be sure to follow up with you after the webinar. Um, so um, as Claire laid out the order and some of the implications of this order, um, I think kind of at the one of the main things that the carriers are pushing back on, or it may push back on, are the fees, but also um, is aesthetics. And that's partly because of the localities really protect that ability to control its right of way and how it has attachments in its, on its poles, not even other um, poles within the right of way, but you know there could be light poles or other things that the city or locality owns and maintains, and this order could you know challenge some of that standard practice of having you know domain over that those types of um, that property. So um, the FCC treats you know aesthetics um, in a way that they have to be clear, reasonable and not discriminatory. So that means they can't be more burdensome than those applied to other types of infrastructure deployments. Objective, published in advance, clearly defined, technically feasible. Um, so really, this is something where it's really helpful to have them, when that, you know, published in advance, the easiest way to do that is just to have an ordinance that is set, sets forth the city's aesthetic requirements and um, lays it out so the carriers that, would, that are coming to locate um, these new technologies are, they, you point them to the ordinance and it's you know the same rule for everyone. We're not gonna treat one carrier differently than another. And it, and it, um, in some ways it's similar to some of the other trends in local government law with you know having to have objective standards for housing developments or whatever, it's, it's a similar type analysis. Obviously, this is much more technical and involves some technical expertise with how the antenna and the equipment will be placed, what it will look like, um, and it will involve oftentimes multiple departments to weigh in, whether it's engineering, planning, um, city attorney's office, IT, all of these may have to weigh in to, to provide the input to create these objective standards. Um, but it's an exercise that does take time, but it is worthwhile because then you, you have it out there and it's published. Um, and of course, you spend the time to create these aesthetic standards that are non-discriminatory, apply equally, and then there's new technology that comes out. So unfortunately, because of the fast-changing environment of wireless deployments, you know, you you finally regulate for 4G and 5G comes out, and then the next wave will be following after that. So there is a certain degree of recognizing when you work on this, you create some standards, you do the best job you can, but there will be a need to revisit these when the carriers start deploying a new technology that may have smaller antennas, go further range, but need to be closer together. I mean, it's things that, you know, unfortunately, as an attorney, I am not well-versed on those uh, aspects, but it is something that you need to be kind of reacting to as much as you can and try to get out in front to, to the extent possible. Um, so another aesthetic requirement that I know is at the forefront of a lot of uh, localities is uh, undergrounding requirements. And again, they, you know, you keep hearing these same keywords. They need to be re reasonable. They cannot be prohibitive. So something that we've seen come across is cities that want to just have a blanket prohibition on under, I mean, a blanket requirement that you have to underground no matter what. And um, 
it's probably not okay if this um, provision, if the order is upheld and becomes, you know, the the law. It's um, I think there's a problem with that. Um, so you kind of have to evaluate it in the same way on the aesthetic slide, which um, you know it has to be reasonable, objective, published in advance, and really for undergrounding, it gets to the issue of technically feasible um, because it's something that when we worked with our clients on developing these standards, we really had to talk to our engineer, and we also talked to some of the carriers about this regarding um, the uh, requirements. Are they feasible, and how are they? And providing a little bit of a backdoor if the carrier can prove to us that the, the requirements are not feasible, um, you kind of have to be ready for that. Also, uh, minimum spacing requirements. Um, that also must be re reasonable, and I kind of glanced to touch upon that briefly, but this whole new deployment is based on the fact that it doesn't need to use these massive towers. Instead, they have smaller, shorter wave antennas that need to be closer together. So if we set a requirement in place that is, you, you know, can only be at least 200 feet apart, but then this new technology comes out and says, oh, yeah, 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 we're using really small antenna, but they're 100 feet apart. And if you deny that, it's going to be an effective prohibition of coverage or materially impacts us. That's something that you just need to be cognizant of when you're drafting these regulations and advising your clients. Um, so revisiting the issue of shot clocks, um, the FCC brought 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 in new shot clocks. So it's 60 days to approve co-location on existing structures, 90 days to approve new, on new poles or towers. And this shot clock, um, it, you need to advise the, whoever's processing the applications to quickly receive it and review it because they start on submission and you have 10 days to review and issue a notice of, of an incomplete application. Um, and it's minute you send an incomplete notice out, it's told, but the minute they respond with more information, it start, the clock starts again. Um, and you can always extend it by mutual agreement, but it's, it's something that you need to just kind of be aware of these timings because it, it can sneak up on you. 60 days is like no time in um, local government business, shot of business. Um, and for we've seen batched applications come in where they send in an application, a carrier will send an application for 15 different small cell attachments in the right of way. And you still have to move those quickly through. There's no exemption for a batched application. Um, so oftentimes, if you can work with a carrier and tell them, hey, we're going we're gonna to work on your batch application, they like the massive deployment. So being able to have a mutual agreement to toll the shot clock for batched applications or more involved individual applications is something to consider. Um, and again, if you don't do anything by the deadline, the applicant can go get an injunction in federal court, but it's not deemed graded. And that's different than the... Um, other shot clock that is for, you know, co-location on existing towers that do not materially change the existing um, wireless antennas. And there was also this question because the recently, after Governor Brown vetoed the state uh, legislation regarding small cell wireless, there was this issue of grandfathering that was available for that that's not here. Um, so the FCC intended for the ruling to cover existing agreements between the carrier or other third party. Um, so FCC does not allow for grandfathering, um, but if you do have existing agreements, you know, um, you may want to look at whether or not there's other arguments as to whether you can rely on that. Um, outside of the world of this FCC order. Um, so this is just the website for the FCC for additional information. Um, if you want to go to get more information or get on notification list for new rulings or updates on this ruling. Um, 
it really is a fast moving area in terms of technology and the legislation to kind of catch up with that. Um, so that's the conclusion of our questions. We, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for us to go through some questions, so bear with us for a second and we'll try to hit some of the questions that we've received through the, the, the webinar. Um, Um, as we're organizing everybody's questions, just a reminder, if you can please utilize the Q&A button in the top right-hand part of your screen, that allows us to track where the questions are coming from. So if we don't get to them in the next 20 minutes or so, um, we'll have your contact information to email you directly. So we have a question that says, we have entered into a master license agreement or agreements with several carriers and that allows them to use our polls at a certain rate. Are those still valid, um, at least in terms of the agreed upon rates and can we continue to enter into those agreements? Um, so the FCC order does provide that there may be facts and circumstances and agreement that might lead to a different result than what's described in the order. However, uh, we don't have any further guidance from them as to what that means or what, uh, whether that limits the scope of their determination or interpretation. And so um, there is a strong argument on the part of the city that this is a contract negotiated by the parties and the terms were agreed upon. And given the specific circumstances of negotiation that those would still be valid. Um, and whether or not you can continue to enter into those agreements, um, there's nothing in the orders that prevents you from proposing to um, to get into these license agreements with carriers. Um, however, now with this ruling in effect and still pending, um, I would expect that carriers will use it and fight to the provisions they're in to challenge your terms and try and negotiating a more favorable outcome for them. And. Um Thank you, Claire. So there's a couple other questions. Um, there was a question about the, the portion of the order regarding aesthetics and um, when that goes into effect. And um, let me try to find that, um, that slide just to re pull it up again. So yeah, it's just, it is correct. The one regarding aesthetic standards will not go into effect until April 15th, 2019. But that's also, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern regarding the um, challenges that were that have been consolidated to the Ninth Circuit. As we said, there is no current stay on the Ninth Circuit, but we're kind of monitoring that and seeing where this goes. Assuming it, there is no stay, assuming this order is upheld, it would become effective on April 15th, 2019. Um, and also, I guess, kind of, it's a good time to talk about, you know, what to do pending this Ninth Circuit appeal. I mean, in this interim, I think there is a risk that the wireless carrier could still make a take a challenge under the order to get a local regulation preempted. So, you know, if this is something that you just need to talk to your client about and recognize if they are willing to just accept the direction of this and try to get some objective standards in place or it's a wait and see and see how the carriers react to the city's position. I mean, there's a, depending on, you know, your, your locality and what, what their needs are and objectives are, there's a kind of different approaches to take and we'd be happy to talk to you offline about that um, kind of how to, to move forward given this. Someone also asked for the web FCC website slide for additional information. So I wanted to put that up again. This is uh, FCC.gov slash document and then a bunch of more words after that. But you can also 
go to FCC.gov and click through to find these. It's under Proceedings tab. That um, here, let me show my cursor for a second. So if you look this Proceedings tab right here, you can um, get to the uh, website that FCC updates on this. Okay. Um, go ahead. And someone asked if you can prohibit bash applications. Um, you cannot. You have to allow them, and you have to comply with the 90-day timeline if they involve both collocation and new new sightings. Um, if they're just one type of sighting, for example, the batch is all just collocating with existing structures, then the individual timelines for those kinds of kinds of sightings will apply. So once uh, 90 days will apply to new sightings, and the 60 will apply to collocation. And uh, there's also some questions on uh, the admin fees um, regarding, and so let me pull up that slide so we can kind of provide a little more information on the fees. Um, sorry, bear with us here. We're jumping around a little to get to those fees. So this is really one of the parts of the order that was really Surprising that they actually just went out and put out numbers that they said were deemed to be reasonable, but um, in fact, the cities could do a study and show the costs that are more than this, and that would be the cost of maintaining our infrastructure and whatnot. But the um, so the recurring fees up here that what they said is 270 per facility per year. That's essentially the rent. Um, that you would charge for the use of the light pole, for example. Um, and then the non-recurring fees, this is the admin fee to process those applications. And I know cities have adopted a whole range of fees for those, above that, at that, below that. Um, so that's just something to be aware of, that just because your fees are above those rates, that doesn't automatically mean they are unlawful under the order. It just means that you may have to find some way to justify them at, consistent with the FCC order. Um, so um, we're going to kind of keep jumping to questions. So we're, you know, there's a bunch that came in, so we're really going to try to get to as many as we can before uh, time is up. But um, if we don't get to your question, we apologize in advance, and we'll, we'll try to follow up with you offline after the webinar. Uh, somebody asked what happens if the application is not responded to within the time frame. Um, under the statutory shot clock, those applications would be deemed granted. Um, as to the time was imposed by the FCC in this September ruling, they're not deemed to be granted. However, um, it does give carriers a cause of action to sue the city um, and to compel them to comply with the timeline. But in, in practice, um, the time that might take to file a lawsuit will probably um, be the same as the city's time needed to make a decision on the application. So in reality, what happens most of the time is that the city and the carriers reach a tolling agreement and they extend the review time for a certain additional days and um, that gives them more time to work on the application and to reach a decision on it. There's uh, some questions about uh, height limitations. Um, and some of these I'm not asking, doing them verbatim, we're kind of batching them because some of the same questions have come up. Um, and one of them is, is can we impose a height limitation on top of our existing light poles? And, um, you know, at first blush, without getting into the specifics of how high these are or whatnot, I think it's possible to have height limitations. Those would seem objective, applied equally to all and upfront and reasonable. Um, and then you kind of then put it back on the carrier to come back and say, okay, that's unreasonable because it's going to, you know, materially prohibit the providing coverage. 
Um, but, you know, an objective standard that says you can't go more than five feet above any light pole or you can't have any attachments on the pole be larger than X or not matching in the color scheme or all that. I mean, I think that's exactly what you should do is look at your existing con attachments of where they're going to go and how to best um, regulate that meets your, your client's needs. Um, one thing that sometimes is helpful is to kind of have some discussions with the carriers while you're adopting these objective standards. And this is a tricky area because they are going to want it to be a certain way. But I think the, in some of the cities we've worked with, we've received some helpful feedback from them through the adoption. And we make it clear that they, this is we're soliciting feedback from a stakeholder. We want to know, you know, why or why not this is feasible or what your input is. And some of these were helpful and helped us kind of learn about their business model and how they deploy wireless coverage. And it um, was helpful to craft the objective regulations that still got at the city's object uh, goals, but um, we didn't create a, an ordinance that out of the gate they're going to say, oh, yeah, this is unfeasible, we can't do this because of, you know, the way our antennas are structured or whatever creates issues. So um, kind of giving yourself time to kind of elicit feedback, you don't, I mean, obviously that you make it clear to them we're not going to necessarily take your comments, but we're welcome to learning more about how your, your wireless coverage is um, deployed is, you know, it was helpful for some of our clients to, to learn that and to, to develop feedback, and then it becomes a more collaborative process, even if you don't ultimately adopt their input um, or in its entirety, you at least kind of understand it better and can craft your regulations in a way that is cognizant of the current technology. Uh, just a couple of clarifications on fast applications and collocation. An application is a collocation if it's proposed on an existing structure or building, um, regardless whether there was an existing wireless facility there or whether it was zoned for that kind of um, installation. And if you have a batch that has both collocations and new applications, then the 90-day applies to all of the sites, not just the new application. Um, there are some questions about how the shot clock works and whether an incomplete, a notice of incompletion letter has, excuse me, a notice of an incomplete application, what form it has to be in, whether, you know, in over the phone, in person, in writing. I mean, I always think having a written record of it is best, um, whether that's snail mail or email. Um, I don't think it's critical, but I do think having a written record of the notice of incomplete is important. Um, and also for any tolling agreement, I would want to have that in writing. Um, Claire, do you have one or two? Going through it, and thank you for you know, being very active with your questions. Um, And just to clarify, there is not a stay that's not, there's not a request for a stay that's been filed in the Ninth Circuit. Um, I think some people are asking what is the timeline for that, but there's not one that's been filed. But because it's a new venue, it's been uh, transferred, there may or may not be one. Any, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get one more last couple questions in here. Um, when do aesthetic standards need to be published? I mean, I think I mean, that really depends on what the outcome is on the Ninth Circuit, but um, I, it's, and this is also kind of strategic in how you work with your client and what their goals are, whether they're, you know, I mean, Across California, there's a whole host of different type of communities that have different, you know, objectives with 
sell deployment. Some is they welcome them and they want to be part of the technology and part of the smart cities deployment. And there's other cities out there that really oppose them. So I think that kind of informs how you are going to move forward with this. But I think to the extent you are going to adopt the set of standards, I think the sooner you start the process, the better um, and get going because with, you know, if you start today, it's arguably going to be, you know, introduction, adoption at the soonest. It's going to be effective right about the time that this becomes uh, valid, assuming that there's no change in the law based on the Ninth Circuit decision, which, um, so I would kind of recommend getting started, having the discussion, getting the right people from the city involved, and getting the kind of technical expertise that you need to understand um, what it looks like um, from a practical standpoint. I mean, some of the things that are were really helpful for some of the cities we worked with were to get pictures of ones and say, these are the ones we like, these are the ones we don't like, and kind of go from there because there's a number of websites out there that show pictures of, you know, if there's the pro one, the pro small cell deployment and the anti small cell deployment websites. If you look at those, you'll get pictures of like, this is great and it makes this look perfect. And there's other ones that just look pretty hideous. So I think you can start to look at them and understand, okay, here is what we want to have attached to our poles or we don't want any attached to our poles and we're going to make you, if you're going to put in a new light pole, we're going to make you replace our light structure and we're not going to charge the rent, but instead we get a new light pole. I mean, carriers are all looking at this in different ways and there's, um, you know, a good range from each carrier and from each city on how to address it, but they're, you know, I think a lot of the carriers are happy to have that discussion and engagement um, and you know, would rather be having that discussion with you, but how can we address your needs while still meeting theirs? Um, but, you know, it's a tough kind of balance for cities because, you know, this is the public right away in some ways we view as sacrosanct and we don't want anyone in there without, but we want to have the absolute power to say who and what and where, but unfortunately this new order is muddying that previous understanding a little bit. Um, so I think that's it we're going to be able to get to today. I really appreciate everyone's questions. Um, if you, your question was not answered in one form or another in our presentation, we will follow up with you. We have all the questions. We just, unfortunately, we can't get to all the questions today. So, um, again, we really want to thank you guys for your time, for your questions, um, and this is an evolving area, so please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have, hold on, let's put up the last slide. Here we are. Um, this is our contact information and our email. Um, please feel free to contact us directly. If, um, if we didn't get to your question or if you didn't have a chance to answer a question right now, We'll leave this out for the last couple minutes, but um, this concludes our presentation, and uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. Just as a reminder, uh, next week we will circulate a copy of the PowerPoint slide deck, uh, CLE certificates, and the recording will also be available. So if you want to go back and review some of the slides, uh, you'll be able to do so or share with your colleagues. Thanks so much for joining us.